1,000 years ago, the first Homo sapien emerged on land. And if you think about the differences in our appearances of the human beings today with the Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago, it is actually vastly different. But if you think about the genome of the human today with the genetic makeup of those Homo sapiens, very little changes has actually occurred. We're actually only 1% different from the Homo sapiens in the past. And the main differences between us and them actually come from behavior, behavioral adaption. We grow up in a society that's actually very different from the society back then. And that's why our neural networks in our head have actually evolved to adapt to these changes in our behaviors. How neural networks work in the world today is that it has a fixed architecture. And the way you learn is just actually by evolving these weights. But the reason why I think this is very ineffective is because the problems that we deal with today are actually the same as the problem that we deal with hundreds and thousands of years ago, like stress. Or we always have this instinct to look for food and to find them. So what if we can actually radically change the architecture of the neural network while evolving their weights to actually evolve new ways to solve problems? It is actually what neural evolution is about. Neural evolution is the process where you can actually evolve both the architecture of the neural networks as, long as, as, as well as the weights of the neural networks itself. In neural evolution, I was really inspired by this concept of neural evolution and decided to use it on something called soft robots. So you guys are probably very similar with hard robots, so those rigid structures that you use in factories. But the problem with hard robots is that since their structure is so rigid, we, can, we cannot actually fine tune their behavior in different environments. And a lot of smart people in the world, including scientists at MIT and Harvard, actually believe that soft robot is actually where we're going in the next five to 10 years. The applications of soft robots are actually crazy. You can develop artificial muscles from soft robots that are safer and stronger and carry a thousand times of the weights of the current hard robot. By combining brain-machine interfaces with soft robot, you can actually allow the patient to move their finger even if they're paralyzed. And another fascinating application of soft robot is that they can actually walk on fire, allowing us to save like millions of lives with people who are in conditions like fire or like in like hazardous conditions. However, one problem with soft robots is that since they're so soft and their structure is so flexible, it is actually more difficult for you to actually evolve a morphology or a structure of a soft robot that actually works. So I was really fascinated by this, uh, fascinated by this problem and decided to use neuroevolution to evolve a soft robot to walk. So there's obviously an endless number of opportunities for soft robots on Earth. But the question I was really curious about was, can we actually evolve soft robots to have the right shape so that they can move efficiently on space? And this is one of the first tasks of space exploration that's actually really important. So I decided to use neuroevolution to simulate a soft robot by myself. Um, and I actually used an algorithm called CPPN Neat, and this is the results that I got. Uh, oh, wait. How do you actually? Okay, so this is actually generation one. And what happens is that I just have like a block of soft robots materials made of voxels. Um, and in generation one, it doesn't really do anything. It just jumps up and down in the same place. Uh, and you can see the different colors. And that is the different distribution of kinetic energy within the soft robots. However, after training this for 250 generations in six hours, I got some more promising results. So now if I import a simulation from new generations, my soft robot can actually start walking. Yeah, so that is essentially how it works. 
Um, as you can tell, um, one of the problems that I struggle with in this project is to evolve the morphology or the shape of the shop robots. And as you can see, my shop robot doesn't currently have any legs. So that would be some of the problems that I will be looking on later in the future. But that's still some really promising results. So, so the results actually seem a lot of fascinating. So how does, how does this actually work? I actually employed an algorithm called NEAT. And what NEAT stands for is Neural Evolution of Augmented Topologies. And basically, that means something very simple. Topology simply refers to the architecture of the neural network. So you can have three hidden layers connected to two, two hidden layers, and then with one hidden, like one output layer. And many topologies basically means that during the evolution process, these architectures can change its shape. And it does so through four basic processes, which is crossover, um, genetic encoding, crossover, mutation, and speciation. So to give you an analogy of how this actually works, let's imagine that we have a population of 100 short-necked giraffes. So you all know that giraffes today have very long necks. But 200,000 years ago, giraffes actually have short necks. However, the genetic, genetic makeup of the short-necked giraffes and the long-necked giraffes actually differ by a couple mutations. And how this works is that the male giraffes mate with the female giraffes, and they give birth to a baby giraffe. And this baby giraffe has one mutation that allows us to have longer necks than its parents. And this obviously gives the baby giraffes an advantage over past populations. The reason being that it can reach higher to the tree to actually grab, grab the leaves. And by being able to do so, it's able to live longer, mate with more giraffes, and produce more offspring. <laughs> And that's how the mutation that codes for long neck giraffes actually evolve and get carried on to next generations. This is a concept uh, coined by Charlotte Darwin known as the survival of the fittest. And this is the core reason why all of giraffes today have long necks. Now, how does this actually work in our neural networks? The first step of this process is called genetic encoding. So before getting started, I have to define a class that codes for the genotype of the object. And as you can see in the video before, my um, cube has a 6 by 6 by 6 dimension. So that's one of the features that I defined in my class. Um, it also had an input layers and output layers and hidden layers. However, what's special about this class, as opposed to like regular neural networks, is that when you start a neural network, you have a fixed structure. Say that you have three nodes on your first layer, two nodes on your hidden layer, and three nodes on your output layer. Um, however, for this network, how it works is that it only has one node at the beginning, and through the process of evolution, if it is necessary, more nodes and more connections will be added to the neural network. So our genotype consists of connection genes and node genes. So what node genes refer to is basically the nodes you see on the tree, like one, two, three, four, five. And the connection genes is basically the connection between the node genes. And it also carries a weight between these node genes. And the weights are randomly initialized at the beginning of generation uh, zero. And the phenotype is essentially what you can see with your bare eyes, which is this neural network right here. The next step is mutation. So mutation can happen in several ways, one of which being the addition of a new node to our neural network. Another way mutation can happen is the addition of a connection node to our neural network. And as the phenotype, or what we can see of the neural network changes, the genotype is also changes, as you can see here. So connection two to five was initially disabled, and connection three to five is disabled after the first generation. The next step is crossover. So when you think about crossing over in nature, it seems pretty simple. You have two DNAs that are similar in structure. They come together because they're similar in structure, and crossing over occurs, which gives rise to a new combination of DNA. But when you think about this problem in two neural networks and them crossing over, it actually becomes more complex. The reason being, say you want to cross ABC and CBA. So ABC is the three hidden nodes of the first network, and CBA is the three hidden nodes of the second network. You can actually have three bacteria, which is six different combinations from just two pairs of hidden nodes. 
However, if you look at these combinations, they actually miss out potentially important information. For example, the first combination is ABB, and it doesn't have C. But the question is, what if C is actually an important piece of information? And you, can, you cannot, so how would you control what information will be retained throughout this process of crossing over? And you can imagine if this number three increases to infinity, n, then we will have n factorial, which is a very, very large number. And this becomes a computationally complex problem. Imagine you organize this shelf of books. If you have 10 books and you have to organize it in different combinations, you can probably do so in 24 hours, but still a very long time. But if you have a thousand books on your shelf and you try to combine this, it's gonna take you days and probably years because there are so many combinations that you cannot keep track of. So we essentially need a way to keep track of what books are good so that we can save them and just recombine these good books. And, and essentially, people call this solution historical co-marking. So whenever two genes cross over, they have to have similarity. And when two phenotype or genotype cross over, they also have to have similarity. So as you can see here, parent one has number one, two, four, five, six, and these are called innovation numbers. So whenever, whenever a new node or a new connection is added to the neural network, it is assigned a larger innovation number. So parent two, for example, has innovation numbers seven and eight, whereas that doesn't exist in parent one. And once you align these two genotypes up and, act, and actually match them together, you can produce an offspring. The parent who scored higher on the fitness function, which is essentially the speed of the robot, um, will get to give more traits, whereas the, the other parent will give less traits. And the last step of this process is actually spe speciation. And what this means is that since your pool of neural networks starting from 100 becomes more and more diverse as many generations pass, it actually becomes really complicated for all of these neural networks to compete with each other in an efficient manner. And how scientists solve this problem is that they divide the large population of neural networks into similar ones, into, different, into smaller populations, and members in each population have similar characteristics. So say you have a population of animals. You can pretty much easily tell that the above group is dogs and the below group is cats. And the reason you know so is because of the phenotype of cats and dogs and that they look different from each other. And the reason why phenotypes look different is because they have different genotypes. So maybe there's a lot of information where we can leverage genotypes to actually divide our large populations into smaller populations. And we use this by computing the compatibility difference. And what this means is that we take the excess genes, which are gene eight and seven and eight, um, of one parent, and then we add it to the disjoint genes, which are genes that do not match up between each parent. And we also take the average of weights, because neural networks that belong to one population or are similar to each other have similar weights. And that's how we can divide the population up into smaller populations. Now, this seems pretty interesting, but how does CPPN, or Compositional Neural Network, actually improve this neat structure? What I've learned is that whenever you have an output, um, an output node, you actually pass it through an activation function. In regular need, the activation function is just sigmoid function, where you swatch the result between zero and one. However, the problem is that if you have only one function, it will limit the diversity of the results and lower the probability of you actually finding a good result through evolution. So that's why CPPN comes in, and instead of having one activation, you have several different activations. And the results are passed through these activation functions at random. So you can actually have a more diverse population, increasing your probability of finding a good result. So my next steps within this project would be to evolve soft robots to walk in different environments, like space, Mars, Mercury, and land. And I also want to see how I can evolve more complex morphologies or structures for these soft robots, allowing it to have legs and arms so that it can move more efficiently in this environment. 
I hope that my work will contribute to the first step of humans being able to use soft robots to explore space. Thank you.